Hi everyone, my name is Amri Fenn. I am a senior in high school from Harding County, New Jersey, and I'm here as the co-founder and an executive producer of Evergreen Story, and I'm here to introduce the fabulous Kalkis Romanium. Next slide. <laughs> so, yeah, just gonna begin. Evergreen Story is a free online storytelling and story catching platform and app. Um, it's similar to StoryCorps, if you know what that is, from NPR, and except our stories are mostly from India and the Desi Diaspora, and we connect our stories to the environment. So we have been on a mission to record, preserve, and share humanity's stories and use the medium of storytelling to plant trees. So we make every story count on Evergreen by planting a fruit tree with a needy farmer in India. Uh, since 2020, we have planted, um, we have published thousands of oral stories and have planted over 50,000 fruit trees, of which 12,000 have been planted in 2021 in South, Southern India. So while we capture all sorts of oral stories tagged under various themes from partition to family heirlooms to college romance and arranged marriage, we have two specific oral history projects we are very proud of that are associated with the Oral History Association of India. Um, the first one is the Parsi Irani Oral History Project um, in collaboration with the UNESCO Heritage Organization Parzor, where we archive first person narrations of the world's most prosperous but rapidly diminishing minority community, the Indian Parsis. And then our second one is in collaboration with the Sahodari Foundation managed by Kalki, and it's the Indian Transgender Oral History Project, and she is, it's fully managed by Kalki, who is here today all the way from Palachi in south, southern India. Um, so she recruits transgender people from all around India and has trained them in the art of story catching. Um, my platform, Evergreen Story, is now the first platform for India's trans community to be able to capture and preserve their voices, their stories, ranging from love and romance to the ongoing strife for understanding, dignity, and acceptance. So thank you to the Yale's LGBTQ Center for hosting us today, and I know Kalki is very excited to speak to all of you. So. Thank you so much, Anvi, for that um, wonderful introduction. Uh, hello everyone, I'm very glad and um, really thrilled to be here at the Yale LGBT Center and um, uh, first of all I'd like to thank uh, uh, Joe Fenn and Andy Fenn for uh, coordinating this whole program with the LGBT Center and all the sponsors, thank you so much for having me. Um, India is, of course we all know it's a very very diverse country and world's most uh, biggest largest democratic country in the, uh, in the entire world. Uh, we have more than 250 languages spoken in different uh, regions and then there are hundreds of dialects within uh, our country. It's so diverse that uh, it's, it's a truly a secular country as well. Um, talking about that uh, LGBT rights, I think in India for thousands of years there is a recorded history of the existence of the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary, uh, gender swapping people. Um, I'd like to do a presentation on the Indian transgender lives. I'm sure it will be fascinating for you as well as a very good learning experience. Along with, we'll just move on from the ancient times to the contemporary times uh, step by step. So this is about, uh, in ancient India there were about 50 uh, words for non-heterosexual gender and sexualities in Sanskrit, Prakrit and Tamil which is also my uh, own uh, language which is Tamil is one of the ancient languages in India like Sanskrit. Kliba, uh, Kindara, Pedi, Pandiga, these are some of the words which were used in the ancient times but words like Kinnar and uh, Pandiga is still used in various dialects and also in Tamil also the Pandaka words is used. Um, right from Vedas, the Purana, Puranas are the epics like Mahabharata and Ramayana and then the Kama Sutra and all that. To Natya Shastra, Natya Shastra is the book of uh, dance, an ancient, I mean particularly the Bhatanatyam and all that is uh, thousands and hundreds and thousands of years it has been passed on through the knowledge. So even in the references of Natya Shastra and uh, other ancient books, 
definitely there are references of gender and sexual uh, diversity. And also in Jain, Jain Agamas and Buddhist Vedantas in India, you can find uh, truly some references. And when we talk about the Indian texts, from as early as 3,000 years ago, document a third gender, which has been, which has been connected uh, to the Hijras, who are from the category of transgender, trans feminine people of the Indian subcontinent since ancient times. Hijras is one cultural identity within the transgender community or the third gender community. Not every person in India identifies as a third gender or a Hijra. Those who, it's a cultural identity. Being a Hijra is something cultural. So if you wanted to be embraced by them, you go join with them and be one of them and practice that life. Uh, that is what is Hijras. But uh, the culture of Hijras has existed in India for more than 3,000 years. It's one of the oldest as well. So these are uh, some of the most beautiful images that these have of the Shiva and Parvati uh, together, the male on the right side and the female on the left side which is the hard side, you know. Female on the left side, and uh, Ardhanarishwara, Ardhanarishwara, and then we have the references of Ardhanarishwara in one of the many temples around India. In uh, Madurai Minakshi Temple in Tamil Nadu, to Maharashtra's uh, um, Ajanta Elora and other important uh, uh, temples and um, architectures around India, you'll find uh, Shiva Shakti or Adhanarishwara, who is a form of male and female, and it has its own uh, theme and definition and uh, theory and philosophy. Uh, the oneness of gender, you can interpret it in different ways. Uh, it's about gender equality, it's about uh, uh, the oneness, it's about gender fluidity. Uh, I mean, in that way, I think the ancient India was much more open and diverse than today. So in Hinduism, Ardhanarishwara, half male, half female fusion of Shiva and Shakti. Shiva and Shakti to the left. is one of the several deities important to many Hijras and transgender <coughs> Hindus and, be, and has been called an androgynous and transgender deity. We have a temple in, um, in my home state, Tamil Nadu, in, 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 the, in the town of Tirchankodu. We have uh, uh, Ardhanarishwara temple and several temples too. So let, let's talk about Mahabharata, which is one of the most fascinating Indian epics, uh, like Ramayana. Mahabharata is so fascinating that there are so many characters in Mahabharata that swap gender, that swap sexuality. And there are kings who, who get pregnant. And uh, so in the Mahabharata, 3,000 years ago, which is uh, one of the oldest epic, one of the two Sanskrit epics, the other one is uh, Ramayana. It is narrated, it, it is the story of Pandavas and Kauravas and the Princess Amba uh, is one of the most important characters in uh, Mahabharata. She, Amba, Ambika, Ambalika, they, they are three sisters and they are abducted uh, by, kidnapped by the, uh, the great warrior Bhishma. Uh, to be married to his cousin. Uh, he wants all these girls, but Amba is in love with another princess, so, and, and the other two girls get married to uh, Bhishma's cousins. What happens with Amba is, uh, since she is in love with another princess, Bhishma, who kidnapped her, would don't want to take her again, so he kind of leaves her back. But her, her lover does not uh, accept her because she has been abducted. So according to the culture that prevailed then, he did not uh, take her in. So she's left alone without, and then she goes to Bhishma and asks him to marry her. So he also refuses because he is a brahmachari, means he is a bachelor forever. He has taken that vow. So uh, at last she's left without uh, uh, getting married or, uh, she's left like an orphan without her home taking her back, her boyfriend leaving, her, the princess leaving her, abandoning her, Bhishma abandoning her and all that. So she wanted to take revenge against uh, Bhishma. Sure. So she takes a very big penance, meditates and does a penance for so many years and then 
the Shiva appears and she asks her, what, what is your, what do you want? And she says, I wanted to kill Bhishma. And he says, that's not possible. Uh, Bhishma already has his fate to be, uh, to die in a certain way. And uh, he will, cannot die because of you. And uh, then she says that at least in the next Janma, that is in my next incarnation, I wanted to, if not now, in the, my next incarnation, I wanted to destroy him. So she jumps into the river and commits suicide. So in the next uh, birth, she was born as a man with the heart of a woman. And uh, she grows up in a palace. And then at one point of time in, her, in his life, now he's he, in his life, he has that consci consciousness that he's, his previous life, he was Amba and the whole story. And then his mission becomes to uh, take revenge, kill Bhishma. And that is how the Mahabharata actually moves. The whole story is uh, uh, about revenge. And uh, one of the most powerful characters is Shikandi, Amba, who becomes a man. So uh, that is one character in Mahabharata. The other one is Arjuna, uh, one of the five uh, brave brothers, the Pandava brothers. Arjuna is the most handsome, beautiful, the bravest one. Um, in one of the incidences, he gets, he gets cursed by a Mohini and then she curses him to be half man, half woman. So Arjuna cannot uh, accept it, so he kind of uh, pleads her to leave him and to uh, pardon her, pardon him, but she doesn't accept. Uh, at last, after uh, so much of begging and all that, she says to him, at least for one year, you have to live that life uh, of a man wearing a robe, uh, like a transgender person. So during one of us, which is like uh, end of the Mahabharata, somewhere end, uh, Arjuna lives as a transgender person. And the name is Brahanala. Brahanala is the character of Arjuna becoming a transgender woman and you know what Arjuna was doing? Arjuna was teaching martial arts and dance to the Princess Uttara in the palace. You know, gender didn't mean, um, I mean, gender, changing gender did not change positions of a person in the society then. That is what it means. So when Arjuna was teaching, and then for one year he teaches gender, I mean, he teaches dance and martial arts to the princess. And then after one year, he becomes a man again. So it's a very fascinating so, story about Arjuna and uh, you know other uh, gender swapping, sexuality swapping uh, in uh, Mah Mahabharata, one of the greatest epics. We have several temples for uh, Arjuna. We have a temple for Mohini. When we talk about Mohini, Krishna has taken the form of a woman many times uh, to seduce um, uh, a Rakshas, that is a, a giant, and kill him to seduce uh, in many ways, actually to seduce the uh, Asuras who are the, who are considers the powerful, but the bad part of the sky, I mean, the heaven. So uh, Krishna in many, many forms, in many incidences, takes the form of a Mokini. So we used to say now, uh, we used to say like, uh, there are nine avatars, that is uh, nine incarnations of uh, Krishna. But there is also a tenth one, and that is Mohini. Mohini is a very special one because of, uh, wherever, whenever Krishna becomes takes the form of a Mohini, he does it for a dharma cause, for a for a cause that uh, is good for the earth. That is what he changes his gender into a very beautiful woman. So these are not just today, hundreds of hundreds of years. It's thousands of years of uh, stories, scripts, epics uh, that has been passed on. Uh, by word of mouth in the Indian uh, culture. And uh, almost it's, it's, it's uh, the story of Mahabharata is in its entirety is across India, all over the states. Yeah, so then let me go to the next slide. So it, as I said, the Hijra community has more than 4,000 years of recorded history in the subcontinent. And the Hijra community is also found in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and other uh, nearby Indian states with their own local cultural context. Yeah, the next slide. 
So we'll come to the Mughal period. Uh, from the ancient period, we jump to the Mughal period, which is before the pre-British uh, pre colonial period. Mughal period was one of the most fascinating periods in India when it comes to art and you know other art forms, architecture. Mughal period is the period when Taj Mahal was also built, the world famous one. So the eunuchs, uh, who are now called transgender, but then they were then called as eunuchs, in the Mughal Empire in the 16th century had a very important presence in the semi-nomadic of the life of the Central Asian rulers during the reign of the Akbar, who is one of the greatest kings, Mughal kings, Islamic Muslim kings of India. Uh, there were presence of eunuchs, which was most visible. Many eunuchs in the service of the sacred harem, uh, close to the sacred person of the emperor and Mughal women, were both servants and officers of the empire. So it's, it's all found in uh, Mughal manuscripts very extensively. Um, if you take about uh, um, the contemporary uh, situation of social situation of transgender people in India, and if you compare it with uh, the ancient times and the Mughal period, it's unbelievable how colonialism has affected our community for more than 200 years. We'll go to the next slide. This is one of the paintings that has been found. Um, uh, it is a collection from the James Ivory Collection. Senior wives of the Mughals playing chaufar. Chaufar is a game in the court with in the court zenana with the uh, eunuchs. So on this side are the uh, on this side are the women, the princes, and then on this side are the trans women. Uh, we call them jananas or eunuchs as well. So they were playing with, the, they, were, they were playing, it's kind of a dice game. They were playing with uh, the princesses and queens. So the kind of uh, positions that they had as advisors to the kings and queens and as chief uh, officers of security and all that in the palace, in the, in the queens and princesses' uh, private rooms was enormous. And these people, especially the Jananas, or the eunuchs then were actually very influential uh, in the kingdom with decision making and all that. There were many uh, brave people, and uh, I don't know if uh, some of you might have seen the movie uh, Joda Akbar in India, an Indian Bollywood movie. There is a character, uh, it's, it's about a love story between Akbar and Joda. And in that film, there is a character about. Uh, a eunuch person who is very close to uh, Joda, the princess, and it is uh, the representation is very beautiful. So this is uh, one of the eunuchs, uh, or we you know what we call now the transgender persons. Kwas Khan is a eunuch of the Bahadur Shah. One of the he is one uh, of, after Akbar. <coughs> There were kings, and then there's uh, Bahadur Shah was also there. So he was one of the uh, closest aid to uh, King Bahadur Shah, who is also one of the Islamic kings. We'll go to the next slide. Yeah. So India's British colonizers. This was their colonial period was between 1858 and until 1947 for such a long time. So India's British colonizers viewed hijras as a multifaceted threat to colonial authority as a population that was ungovernable in manifold ways. Misgendering feminine hijras as men, colonial officials used hijras as professional sadomites who challenged the colonial legal system, which was based on heterosexual, reproductive sexuality and the family. In the colonial way, hijras were an obscene public nuisance that undermined the order of public space. Uh, as soon as they came to India and they gained power and influence through their government and through their, you know, their strategies, divide and rule strategies, one of the things that they did was to, uh, you know, they discipline people, you know, they wanted to discipline people and discipline the wanderers, regulate everything, regulate the society and all that. Transgender community has been living free, happy, and street dancers, and they were everywhere, of course. So 
the trans community, the eunuchs were considered as a nuisance by the British, uh, who were so focused on, you know, gender and sexuality and Bible and all that. So we'll go to the next slide. So this is when uh, the decline of the transgender community or the eunuch community in India started. The Criminal Tribes Act of 1872, but actually it started even before that in 1871. And before that, there were several uh, laws that accumulated to creating this act. Was introduced by the colonial British uh, to affect the elimination of hijras by preventing initiation and, and castrations in the British thought that castration essentially to hijrahood as well as by erasing hijras as a visual, visible social group in public space. Individuals listed on the UNEC register, they had a register. So every person who was uh, under, uh, there were 33 communities actually who were uh, not just the hijra community or the transgender UNEC community, the gypsies, uh, the street dancers and a lot of other caste people, uh, lower caste people who were considered lower caste, they were all uh, uh, the victims of this Criminal Tribes Act. In short, what does this Criminal Tribes Act does is that you can uh, arrest anybody uh, in this 33 communities without a warrant and you can keep them in jail or in prison and interrogate them any number of days. And they have to come every day to uh, sign in a register that is maintained in the police station. So it was horrible. And uh, individuals listed on the unit register that prohibited from wearing feminine dress and performing in public, thereby outlawing hijra's gender expression and reducing their livelihood options. So previously, because of their uh, presence and cultural identity, transgender people did have many options of livelihood. But after the uh, introduction of this law and uh, the discipline acts by the British, slowly they started to live a hidden life. So they could not move from place to place because of the register problem and uh, uh, Hijra people's lives, what started because of this act, till today, till today, the community is in dire straits. It's definitely, the community is still begging. Majority of the transgender community people in India are begging and doing sex work because of the colonization and uh, you know mor morality that was brought into India. We we'll go to the next slide. So these are some of the uh, found images and uh, in the British Library, the Indian transgender community at British Raj. You see, they have a drum, so they were kind of street dancers, performers, and. Uh, that was a group of uh, dancers as well, artists from the transgender community. <coughs> These are three transgender community persons or the hijras. It's a portrait of uh, a hijra and her companions in the 1960s. And this was also a photo from the British Library. And we move to uh, what is happening today. At present, the community of transgender people in India lead a marginalized existence, often spotted begging for arms in the streets or at people's homes on the occasion of childbirth or marriage. Uh, Though transgender people today beg on the streets and uh, dance and then collect money, there is still uh, references and then there is still uh, the cultural connections still exist. The religious connections still exist. In India, there is a belief among the Hindus that when a transgender hijra blesses your child, uh, it's really good for the child's future. And when a hijra curses you, it's really bad. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of a uh, belief by uh, lots of Hindus, especially in the north, northern states of India. And uh, it's different in different places. For example, in, uh, in places like Delhi, the transgender hijra community is much more respected. They go for special occasions like wedding and uh, uh, naming of a child, a child is born, or business openings and all that. They go in all their beautiful dress and go bless, uh, do some dancing and 
take lots of money lots of money but in places like mumbai and chennai and all that uh, the transgender people have to stand on the streets or on the highways uh, to pick up clients for sex work or for begging so it's different in different parts of india but what are it is whether there is some sort of a religious uh, recognition it's still it's still not really fully uh, acknowledged you see just because uh, uh, in, uh, many people in our country respect transgender people and uh, seek their blessings doesn't mean uh, they actually are welcoming them to their homes you see it's only for a blessing and it's only to it's only a ritual that they wanted to do otherwise i think the community is not respected what activists like me are striving to do is that we don't want that kind of respect don't treat us as gods or demigods or children of god whatever or uh, uh, people with special powers or like that treat us as humans that is what we are striving for treat us just as ordinary human beings give us that respect and space and equality that we deserve so this is one of the uh, trans person uh, who is doing a dance in india they lead a marginalized existence as i said and are often spotted for begging for arms in the streets and at people's homes on the occasion of childbirth and marriage and that also happens in places like pakistan and uh, bangladesh and other places yes so um now i'm going to talk about activism uh how we did it there have been many milestone victories especially for the past 10 years we have achieved uh, some of the milestone uh, legal recognition social recognition for our uh, transgender non binary community so educating the educators is one of the most important things i see educating and sensitizing the academic faculties the professors the teachers of schools the professors and lecturers in universities and colleges is so essential part of uh, um creating a world that accepts lgbtqi people and acknowledges our rights um on gender equality is the most important to create an inclusive society where transgender people can live with peace because in india transgender people are wandering everywhere but you don't see any references about them their lifestyle their culture in books in academic books neither in school nor in college uh, so there is a phobia in the uh, in the public that who are these people why are they like this what is the story behind them and all that so there should be uh, we strive activists like me we strive for inclusion of our history and culture and our existence in the academic curriculum in indian schools and universities so so this is one of uh, uh our my sensitization sessions uh, sessions where i was sensitizing high school teachers on gender diversity and inclusivity um this is also a part of my work in creating a healthy society for the future so i i believe that when you educate uh when you educate students uh, it's like probably say he might teach to another person when you educate one child the teach that child influences or teaches another person when you educate a teacher the teacher can educate hundreds of students so educating our educators the professors lecturers school teachers is so important because that education is missing in india our, the education on gender and sexuality is missing because our academic how the whole academic uh, curriculum is ba based on the british model so it is so uh, na narrow minded and all that so we need to fall out of that jump out of that and uh, embrace our nativity embrace our uh, culture the originality so uh, one of the other important uh, activism work is sensitizing the judiciary the legal fraternity so lawyers and judges play an important role in upholding the rights of the underprivileged so i have lobbied with the supreme court judiciary for legally recognizing <coughs> transgender rights in india for more than 15 years i and a lot of activists 
like Gauri Savan, Lakshmi and Priya and so many of them from different parts of uh, our states, we have been lobbying, advocating with the Supreme Court of India as well, sorry, with the local uh, judiciary, district high court, uh, magistrates and judges and state, uh, <coughs> entire state judiciary through seminars and conferences and uh, by meeting them and you know having public hearings with the transgender community we have been time and again for more than 15 years we have been sensitizing our judiciary one of the results of uh, that sensitization was in 2000 in uh, 2012 our uh, former supreme uh, court of india chief justice altamas kabir sir uh, he filed a petition in the supreme court of india he was the head of NALSA, uh, National Legal Services Authority of India. He filed a public litigation on behalf of NALSA to the Supreme Court for legal recognition of the transgender community. So this move from him was a win by us because we sensitized him. We sensitized the entire judiciary of India, especially the most important ones who are sitting in the Supreme Court. We sensitized them. And organizations like UNDP and others and the local ministries of our states also helped us in organizing these sessions where we sensitized the lawyers and judges right from the Supreme Court to the local court. And st we still do it. We still do it. And uh, through that kind of uh, activism and, uh, you know, advocating with the judiciary uh, nonstop, that is what helped us in achieving some of the milestone victories in our Indian uh, legal rights for the LGBTQI community. We'll go to the next slide. So one of the things that, uh, this is a very interesting project, that is one of the things that I did in 2010. Uh, in India, you know that uh, arranged marriage, marriages are uh, the thing in India. They are the most cultural, uh, culturally accepted uh, thing, arranged marriages are. So in India, um, there are many matrimonial websites where you can find brides and grooms and uh, you can apply for marriage and all that. So one of the thing is that uh, they have a, uh, one of the particular very popular matrimonial website from India. I and as well as my friend, we, we created a profile and uploaded our pictures and we wrote texts that we are trans women looking for a groom uh, in India. and what are we looking for and all that thing. Yeah. So the next day, the profile was deleted. So the reason we had, uh, when we asked them, the reason we were given was that they don't accept transgender people. That's what their explanation was. So what we did was instead of going and fighting with them, we wanted to create a matrimonial website for us, which I thought is the right thing to do. So we created a, a tirunangi.net which is a matrimonial website for uh, uh, our transgender women community. With just six profiles, we create, I and my friends, five other friends, just the six of us in this website who were looking for uh, grooms. So this, uh, we launched it with the press meet and within a week's time, we got around 2000 proposals for all the six of us. So right from, uh, scientists to lawyers to you know businessmen and uh, some you know very big uh, oily shakes from middle east they also <laughs> <laughs> they also send proposals i mean i i can remember one of the in one of the emails from uh, i think one of the middle east country uh, big business barons i think he wrote that he has already four wives and he wanted me to be his fifth wife and he'll take care of uh, that and all that and there were many interesting uh, proposals as well. So we were, I mean, it was like, uh, uh, it wasn't what was uh, projected in the media and it wasn't what it was. People want, people don't consider transgender people as to be outcast and not fit for marriage. There are lots of people who think that transgender people can marry, transgender people deserve to be married and can be a good partners. And I think that is why uh, more than 2,000 proposals came. Of course, at that time in 2010, uh, transgender rights were not legalized. So none of us got married. The point is like, we wanted to establish uh, a statement that 
we are here and we are queer mm -hmm. we are trans and we deserve to we deserve to be married if you're if you deserve to be married then we also deserve to be married and if you're wanted then we are also wanted that is what uh, we wanted to establish and we established it in 2010 so we'll talk about art so performance art is one thing for activism so i and our team and a lot of other groups around india we uh, used dance and theater as a form of uh, uh, telling our stories and especially since i'm a poet as well i write a lot of poetry and uh, my team at our foundation uh, sahodri foundation i'll talk about our foundation soon we perform in spaces um, in colleges, universities, in galleries, in uh, sometimes in public spaces too, to tell our stories of free, pain, pride, dignity, hope, and our stories of identity and courage, of course. So we do it through uh, dances, like Bollywood dance also we do, and traditional dance, fusion dance, theater, solo theater, all kind of art we express to tell our stories. The next slide. So these are some of the artworks uh, created by me and our community people as well. So this is the story of Arvan. Um, this is a story. This that second picture is from Mahabharata. One of the stories of Mahabharata. These are different different representations, and of course, I love Frida Kahlo, so I paint her very often. And over to the next slide. So we'll talk about literature. So I um, recently published my book called We Are Not the Others, which is, um, I have a copy of it here. So We Are Not the Others is a collection of uh, my poetry. Uh, my personal uh, journey as a transgender person. And also I tell the stories through this book, I tell the stories of uh, people um, with whom I had lived in experiences and uh, people's uh, stories that need to be told. Uh, I've lost so many of my friends in um, suicide and murder and uh, AIDS and all that. Their stories were never told. I mean, nobody knows about them. Yet they struggle, suffer, they fought, uh, but nothing is documented at all uh, because of the ex uh, because of the high uh, homophobia and transgender uh, transphobia that was existing uh, 15 years ago and during my childhood. Documenting their fight for dignity was impossible, so I wanted to uh, record some of those stories, document some of their stories. Uh, in through my poetry so i did it so i wanted to read one poem from uh, from my collection i choose that okay palace i cut 135 So, phallus, I cut. No transcendental yoga I performed to transform myself into a woman. This poem, I read it in Harvard too. No transcendental yoga I performed to transform myself into a woman. I cut my phallus, soiled in blood and transcending death, I became a woman. Oh, you do not have ovary, woman, you are not, said you. Well, a wait as you have severed your manhood, you are now a desolate tree with decayed barks. You have dug the grave of your own lineage. Live you may till your roots last. The earth that bears you shall give up one day as you have not planted your branches below, said you. Well, I do not want an ovary to carry your excretions of caste and religious fanaticism. And I do not want in my ovary the gestation of those seeds to grow into a tyrannous tree. 
Many a woman, as she carried the seeds of your discriminations, made her ovary your lavatory. Luckily, I am not a woman by birth. And that you refuse to accept me as one is in fact my real freedom. I do not recite the gyno grammar you have crafted. Call me an error in nature, an error of nature. Call me what you will. For sure, I know it myself, for sure, who I am at any given hour. Renouncing religion, casting away caste, we are united as the rejected. We are united as the rejected. Can you live the life we live? Can you become a mother without carrying a womb? Can you become a daughter without sucking at your mother's breast? I can. Cut the phallus of your chauvinism, and then you will know who you are. And then, and only then, you tell me that I'm not a woman. So that's the poetry. Thank you. I'd also like to read another one. It's called, Don't Tell That To Me. It's on page 31, okay. Don't tell that to me. I'm tired of you telling me how I don't look like a transgender woman. I'm tired of you telling me I look just like a real woman. I'm tired of you telling me I'm so brave. I'm tired of you telling me everything is perfect except my voice, which could be more feminine. I'm tired of you asking me when was the first time I felt that I'm a transgender. I'm tired of you asking me if I live with my family. I'm tired of your curiosity. I'm tired of your sympathy. I'm tired of your stare. I'm tired of your whispers. I'm tired of you asking me to bless you. To you and to the million others, I want to shout, I am made of flesh and blood, of fear and hope, of joy and pain. I'm like you. I'm human too. Particularly this work, uh, this poetry, I wanted to write because this is something I go through every day. Kalki, you're lovely, you're beautiful, but your voice, you can work on your voice. I don't want to work on my voice. No, so a lot of transgender people, we, uh, we all go through different kind of uh, stereotyping and questioning and it's not just one day. It's, an, it's, a, it's continuous, entire life we come across people who question us. So this was one of, uh, there is a place called Gender Park in Kerala. It's a very beautiful uh, themed place where there's a lot of discussions are going on about gender equality and all that. I love Gender Park. So in Gender Park, I had my book reading, author reading. So these are some of the images. And to the next slide. So films, films have a greater influence in India. The visual arts have a great influence on people. So in 2010, uh, uh, in 2010, I was invited by the uh, US Cultural and Education Affairs Department as a guest, IVLP guest, International Visitors Leadership Program guest. And I visited several places, New York and uh, Salt Lake City and Washington DC and uh, other places. So after I returned to India, uh, there was my interview in a newspaper. So one of the film directors saw that and uh, I was approached to play a, a main lead role in a movie in 2010. I was a little more younger at that time. <laughs> so that is the movie, Nartaki. It's a very beautiful film. It's also available on uh, YouTube right now for free, but without subtitles, of course. It is a beautiful story about a, a transgender kid being abandoned by uh, its family and then struggling, uh, running away to Mumbai, um, joining with other Hijra community, uh, getting exploited and um, uh, the whole Hijra community also suffers because of exploitation and how she runs, come back again to Tamil Nadu where she was born and she learns to dance Bharatanatyam, the classical dance and she becomes a very famous dancer. She falls in love but is cheated and then, but still bounces back, emerges as an activist. So it is a, a very beautiful story of a transgender person. It's a, one film in Indian 
uh, film history which talks entirely about uh, right from childhood to adulthood the struggles a transgender woman faces and we also have another very interesting project called the community video project because the mainstream media in india is very fascinated by breaking stories sensitizing sensitize sensit i mean like sensational news and breaking stories and all that and also stereotyping about uh, trans and lgbt people is so prevalent uh, was so was so prevalent uh, 10 years ago at least now it has come down to a very drastic thing we have a lot of media people who are very friendly very understanding and all that uh, their narratives are also from our narratives not their narratives so this project was particularly important the video voice uh, the video community video project is where we give a camera to uh, the transgender person to trans community anybody and uh, she keeps that she films her life for a couple of days or three days and all that and then she returns it we take that footage and we create a film so, and then, then the camera goes to the next person so like that we have created s uh, several films it's all available on youtube uh, in our sahodri foundation youtube channel so for the first time they talk about their mothers trans women talk about their mothers they talk about their fishermen neighborhood uh, one person kanchana that's her she talked about um, uh, a visually challenged person who was uh, proposing to her she fell in love with him and how it was beautiful and all that these are spaces that are not created you know we don't have space to talk about uh, uh, our issues in the mainstream we don't have a space where we can stand up and talk about our lives from our voices and that is why uh, the video project gets an importance as well as the evergreen story is such an important project because i think that it is the voice of our community not somebody else backing up our voice and telling our stories through their narratives no it's our stories from our voices uh, that is why it is very special and i think that these are uh, these archives are important because 50 years down the line many of us would die but our history would be recorded it will be alive is important for researchers students professors and it's also important for many other it's important to preserve the history our history our uh, struggles our life um, it's so important i think so so that is why uh, video projects and uh, oral history transgender oral history evergreen stories oral history is also so important in keeping uh, our history alive telling our stories uh, alive keeping them important because i know without this book this book tells at least five people's stories through my poetry i tell five people's story they were not there to this they were born they struggled they suffered they died that, that's all that's all was their life it was so sad but i wanted to honor them so i preserve their life as poetry similarly we are honoring through evergreen story and uh, other projects like this we are honoring the transgender community that deserves a voice that deserves the stories their lives to be told that deserve uh, a respect on our existence and survival yeah i'd like to talk a little bit about what our foundation does too so through art we heal at sahodri foundation we have the turi guide project through which many underprivileged transgender people are offered free workshops, art classes to learn art, drawing, painting, uh, theater skills. The Tourigate project supports uh, them through collecting their artworks and displaying at art galleries and any sale money that emerges goes 100% to the community. So it's one of the most beautiful projects where transgender people come together to create artworks, to creativity. And they, uh, our community people enjoy it immensely because uh, spaces like this, creating art is not their priority at all. They think only people who are luxurious do art. Uh, people have uh, nothing to do with, they do art. But it's not so. We tell them that art is where your heart is. You can, you can express yourself completely, independently, freely, without any prejudices. And we collect this art and we sell them and give the money which is supportive to them. 
uh, a life away from begging and sex work. Hardships sex work, of course. Documenting the abuse, the Red World Project. This is another documentation project that we do. So we encourage transgender people to speak about the abuse they have to endure because of their gender identity and coming out. Because a lot of us go through sexual abuse, physical abuse. I've gone through that too. But we refuse to talk about it. We shy to talk about it. Uh, our culture is one of the reasons and our families are also one of the reasons. We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about uh, abuse and all that that easily. So many a times it's always someone at home or a partner who is the perpetrator of a sexual abuse for a trans person. So the community people, what we encourage them to do is we encourage them to write their experiences uh, without any inhibitions and fear. They write on papers and uh, we encourage them to imprint, uh, paint their palms in red and put it on the uh, paper. And uh, to show resistance, of course. We exhibit these documents, uh, we enlarge these documents with their consent we exhibit in universities and galleries and encourage conversations on empathy and nonviolence, most importantly. Because uh, these are stories that need to be heard. The kind of abuse that each one of us has gone through. I'd say that every transgender person uh, goes through at least one experience of abuse. Not just in India, in the entire world. We all go through such kind of abuse. And it's important uh, to not keep it inside. It's important to write about it, talk about it, uh, and show your resistance in some way. This is one of the ways to we did it. Yeah. Over to the next slide. <coughs> so this is uh, one of the other important projects that we do, the Evergreen Story, along with uh, Joe and Anvi and Anya. Uh, Evergreen Story and the Sabodri Foundation, together we create the Transgender Oral History Project to document hundreds of uh, people, transgender people's life histories from all over India, right from Kashmir to Tamil Nadu and from Manipur to Gujarat. We are uh, determined to uh, give them the much needed space they deserve. We interview and record their histories through their own voices. With the community's consent, we publish it online for people to hear. The purpose of the project is to encourage understanding, empathy, inclusivity, and preserve their voices for hundreds and hundreds of years to come. I think uh, the beauty about Evergreen Story is that um, unlike video projects, it doesn't require so many equipments and all that. Even with the phone, uh, you can record it. Wherever they are, if they're comfortable, they can speak over the phone or uh, they can speak over uh, a computer and whatever it is. It is just that um, who, is, uh, who is interviewing them is also important. At many times, transgender people don't trust others uh, in India, men, or women, or people like that. Uh, a community person <coughs> feels comfortable with another queer person. That is when they open up. Can I have water? <coughs> and uh, when we, because we know how to frame uh, questions and we know how to get the answers also, and we, uh, we respect and acknowledge their their presence and the history of our community and all that, and. Uh, the questions are also like right from their childhood more, be more on to their struggles and all that. You must listen to Evergreen Story Voices. The website name is evergreenstory.org. Yeah. Sensitizing the public is one thing, but sensitizing our own community on their rights is another important aspect. In India, most of the transgender people have been uh, school dropouts because of the existing transphobia and because of hundreds of years of colonization. <coughs> we have created generations of people whose view on uh, whose view on gender and sexuality is so narrow-minded. 
that a boy changing into a girl or a girl changing into a boy, an effeminate boy or a uh, masculine girl is still, of course, a taboo, of course. So, uh, and another thing is within the transgender community itself, there is homophobia. Within the gay community, there is transphobia. So we need to, uh, we need to uh, we need to educate ourselves that is so important one of the things that we do is to sensitize our community on our rights that is not just trans rights but on the entire lgbt spectrum's rights uh, through our foundation we help transgender people get their government identity cards ration medical certificates government loans and grants to start their entrepreneurship and all that is one of the pro photographs when we got one such document. So this is one of the festivals that we conducted. So these are some of my friends, all of them. Uh, in last year, in November, Sahodri Foundation and the Lions Club, local Lions Club, together we conducted the Transgender Food and Art Festival. Uh, first time in our town we created such a festival. Never in India before such a festival was conducted. Uh, because the speciality about uh, transgender people in my hometown is that many of them are uh, working as caterers. Many of them are uh, uh, running catering services in the sense that when there is a marriage, uh, the, the party gives them orders. So they cook for 1,000 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, 10,000 people. They can cook up to 10,000 people too. So with the with the beautiful skills and uh, management skills of caterers they don't get opportunities because of the existing transphobia so when we conducted this art festival we made some delicious uh, chicken biryani mutton biryani and different varieties of uh, all different varieties of non-vegetarian as well as vegetarian food for vegetarians so 23 different types of food we created for and each one was made by one trans person so each dish was made by one uh, one uh, chef. So 23 people were selling 23 food and it was a grand success. Within two hours of opening the counter, everything was sold. And people really loved, uh, loved the food. And this year we are going to have a second edition in November when I go back. So when uh, we come to the Supreme Court and legal rights of uh, what happens in India, so um, the right to self-identification of the third gender is the most important one that happened in 2014 because of years of activism. In the 2014 landmark ruling, the Supreme Court announced that to defend and to protect rights of transgender people guaranteed by Indian constitution, hijras and eunuchs must be considered as third gender. They will have a right to choose their own gender identity, the Apex Court ruled. Um, it also ordered that transgender people must be treated as socially and educationally backward classes, must be given reservations in admissions to public educational institutions and jobs, and must have access to government-run welfare schemes. Sorry about the mispronunciation of transgenders. It should be transgender persons, actually. So uh, this was an important one, but at the same time, uh, many in the transgender community feel that uh, we are not third gender. We also feel that we don't need a third gender recognition. Many feel uh, we are women. Some feel we are third gender. So that kind of an identity uh, differences are also there. I believe that each one's identity should be acknowledged and accepted. So the 2014 legal recognition was absolutely an important one. Over to the next slide. So this is one of the, the way downward, how we did our activism and all that, and what are the milestone victories we created over our activism. So starting from April 2014, there has been intense changes. Indian Supreme Court legalizes transgender identities in 2014 April, and in August 2017, right to privacy, privacy judgment. The Supreme Court says sexual orientations essential attribute of pri it's an at essential attribute of privacy and must be protected uh, so important this judgment is and in september 2018 section 377 of the indian penal court which criminalized homosexuality and this section was uh, 
uh, is one of the colonial law that was created. It was decriminalized, which was, was, uh, which was there to criminalize homosexuality by the British colonial. Uh, this was decriminalized in September 2018. And in May 2022, this year, the National Medical Commission banned conversion therapy and called it professional misconduct. Conversion therapy is uh, when uh, you you take a transgender or a, a gay person, when the family takes them to a doctor to do conversion, you know, make them heterosexual. And in September, a few months ago, so, sorry, last month, Supreme Court widened the definition of family. It said uh, unmarried couples and queer couples if there are two transgender or five transgender people living together as a family, that is also a family. If there are two mothers, two fathers with a child, that is also a family. So this is also another important uh, recognition. So within a span of uh, uh, 10 years, uh, with, uh, with an intense activism that we have been doing, LGBT community in India, uh, one after the other, one after the other, we have been seeing many victories, uh, I think, but it's also, it doesn't mean everything is rosy because uh, uh, more than 70% of the trans population in India still gets rejected by our families and still are unable to continue our education or go to school, finish a degree and go to a, a good college. Apart from that, uh, as an activist, I also do a lot of corporate sensitization. I give uh, sessions to many corporations in India and across the world. Uh, one of the outcomes of that was many uh, companies like Adobe and uh, Micron and a lot of other companies, they all offer jobs for transgender people at all levels, of course. But the problem is there are no takers. Our community is still, you know, um, many of them are school dropouts, very few graduates in the community because of uh, uh, family rejection. They were on the streets and their lives changed and they lost their certificates and were not interested in education. Were never, could never continue their, uh, that opportunity to get educated, uh, live a life much more comfortable than what they live. So because of uh, family rejection, everything changes. And one of the thing is that even though now as the activists we are trying to change it, uh, sensitize our uh, corporate, and they open up jobs for transgender and LGBT people. It's difficult. So I think it will take more years for our community to be sensitized, and maybe another 10 years down the line. Yeah, the next slide. So um, this is about uh, image acknowledgments from the Hindu Indian newspaper, so the Midday British Library and BBC. Uh, these are all uh, people from whom I grabbed images. So thank you for the presentation. Tirunangai is a word in Tamil, which is a very beautifully coined word. Sometimes hijra, uh, the word hijra is not, uh, in some parts of India is considered as a mean word. But Tirunangai is a word in our Tamil culture, um, endorsed by one of the former chief ministers of Tamil Nadu, uh, Ms. Kalingar Karunaniti. Tirunangai means respectable woman, and that is a word that is, is a beautiful Tamil word. That uh, it's, a, it's, it's a two classical Tamil words coined into one uh, to address the trans women. So I am a Tirunangai, but that is not who I am. Sometimes uh, these stereotypes ourselves as okay, I'm a transgender woman, I'm gay, so what? That's just one of my identities. I'm not all of that. I'm a human, I'm an artist, I'm an activist, I'm a poet, I'm, uh, I'm an orator, I'm a speaker. These are some of my identities. I happen to be a transgender person and that is the last identity I'm worried about and you should be worried about too. So yes, I'm a Tirunanga, but that is not who I am, is the statement. Thank you. So I want to publicly thank our, our speakers, uh, Akalki and Anvi, and we have a small token of appreciation. <laughs> Just some little yell swag for you. Thank you. Um, so.
Uh, and then if you have any questions, I'm sure uh, our speakers will both like to share some more for it with you. So, yeah. As it wasn't um, happy to answer yeah. our questions. Yeah, so, so feel free to uh, stick around if, if you do have questions. Um, and thank you all for joining us today for the lunch and learn. Yeah, yeah. If you have any questions, I'll be very glad to answer. I have a question about your book. Yes, can, can we uh, purchase that book, uh, in, like online? I, just, uh, I just have one, a couple of copies. But if you're in, if you re really need it, it's available on US Amazon website. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get a copy Amazon. for our library. Uh, you can just say, we are not the other. Okay. It's available on Amazon. Yeah. Are they helping your community, or what is what do you think they can do? Well, it's kind of a mixture. Yeah. Um, my take. You're talking about my take on the government. Yeah. I would say Modi is one of the very efficient prime ministers uh, that India has had. Um, I'm really happy about some of the things that he did uh, for India, does for India, but at the same time. Uh, People like me who are marginalized, we have a fear that uh, uh, we'll be oppressed more and more, you know, because of religious domination. Uh, religious domination is not really a good thing to, to, pro to uphold uh, rights of equality, <coughs> you know, and uh, that is one thing I'm, uh, the community is worried about. But nevertheless, uh, the Supreme Court endorses our rights. So it has been really helpful. But at the same time, um, uh, as India gets uh, non-secular slowly, uh, a lot of uh, problems could emerge for uh, minority community. So that is one of the uh, major worries of our community, yes. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the talk, by the way. Um, and something that I see that you talk a lot about it, like sensitization work and how difficult it is to like de-entrench this colonial attitude. And talking a lot with like even Indian people who are here for generations or not last generation, it's very difficult to talk about LGBT rights yeah. and all that. Right. Can you talk about how you address that a little bit? Like how do you convince people that this is not like how it always was and how it should be? Yeah, yeah. I think um, uh, the most important, most difficult thing for us uh, Indian people is to talk to our families, yeah. convince them, make them understand. I, I know that. But I think uh, uh, we could simply do some of the things is uh, uh, when we talk directly to them, sit with them, they may not really want it. They will be shy and all that. I think uh, uh, reading books, Watching films is one thing. Uh, they could take our family to events. Is another. I mean, it's it's a slow process, you know. Acceptance is a slow process, and I believe uh, that a lot of our in India, uh, a lot of sensitization was done through the media, through the films, the representation, the changed representation uh, of the queer community, the dignified representation of the queer community in. Bollywood and movies and on TV have a heavy, heavy influence. And I think through movies also you can, of course, do. Yeah, it's only through, uh, through visual arts has a very greater power in influencing people. And I think Indians are so fascinated by movies and all that. So I think um, showing them appropriate uh, uh, material and uh, sensitizing them through that is, would help. And also a letter. I, I used to, uh, one of my, uh, one of the young trans person approached me. He wanted to say about his gender identity to his mother. Didn't know how to do it. So I asked him to write a letter. So he wrote a heartfelt letter to his mother and uh, his mother accepted him. So things like that, there are different ways of doing it. I believe that's not one way. There are many ways of doing it. I also have a follow-up question, but I guess you probably wait in my other people. 
Yeah, like the head. I think we, uh, I focus doing it more uh, to the teachers uh, because the teachers always speak in a language to the children, uh, you know, in a much more appropriate language, I think so. But uh, when it comes to students, I, uh, I do these sessions for high, higher secondary school students, uh, not for uh, two little children. Uh, that's how we do it. That's how it's, it's actually happening in India too. I mean, they invite us uh, activist people to talk to 11 standard, 12 standard students and to the teachers especially um, and to the colleges majorly. So major, majority of the invitations uh, for speaking, for sensitizations come from colleges and um, some of them come from schools and they're all from 11th and 12th grade students departments yes but I believe that it should start from young age yes any other question yes please um, so we talked a lot about the, the hijra community and the transgender community and I kind of wanted to know are those the same thing necessarily or <coughs> Uh, transgender is an umbrella term, right, right, the right. entire term, as you know, in and Hijra is one of the communities yeah. uh, in the umbrella, okay. which is a Hijra is a cultural identity yeah. in the north of India, especially, uh, and it has its influences in other parts of the uh, uh, entire country as well. And I think Hijra people have their own way of, uh, you know, livelihood, um, way of life. And then are they creating a family a system a hierarchy and all that mm -hmm. it has its own um, uh, legacy and all that which is also uh, thousands of years of old so uh, I don't myself I don't <laughs> consider myself hundred percent a Hijra community person uh, I consider myself as a trans woman but if necessary um, my role changes as well so my role uh, I go into a cultural identity as well yeah, that's all. Uh, okay. What does your journey look like for the your time in the United States? Like the future? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what, uh, what do you hope to accomplish while you're here visiting? Um, to talk about the pride history, the proud history of uh, transgender people in India and establish that uh, uh, queer people are everywhere, have existed not just in India, but of course in the US as well, in all lots of other countries as well. It is just that uh, uh, colonialism, religion, and uh, you know, uh, things like that, uh, inappropriate laws, these are the things that really have been oppressing our history, uh, our culture, the queer culture, transgender culture, uh, LGBT lives and all that. So through establishing this, I am trying to uh, say a statement that we have always existed, not just in India, but in other parts of the entire world as well. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.